Just yesterday morning, they let me know you were gone. Suzanne, the plans they made put an end to you. I walked out this morning and I wrote down this song. I just can't remember who to send it to. I've seen fire and I've seen rain. I've seen sunny days that I thought would never end. I've seen lonely times when I could not find a friend But I always thought that I'd see you again Won't you look down upon me, Jesus You gotta help me make a stand You just got to see me through another day my body's aching and my time is at hand I won't make it any other way Oh, I've seen fire and I've seen rain I've seen sunny days that I thought would never end I've seen lonely times when I could not find a friend but I always thought that I'd see you again Been walking my mind to an easy time My back turned towards the sun Lord knows when the cold wind blows It'll turn your head around Well, there's hours of time on the telephone line To talk about things to come Sweet dreams and flying machines in pieces on the ground. Oh, I've seen fire and I've seen rain. I've seen sunny days that I thought would never end. I've seen lonely times when I could not find a friend. But I always thought that I'd see you, baby. One more time again now. Thought I'd see you one more time again. There's just a few things coming my way this time around now. Thought I'd see you, thought I'd see you now. Hey everybody, I want to thank you all for being here. Um, Dad was so beloved by so many people and it's such a hard time to have something like this happen. Not only because I at least hadn't been able to spend as much time with him as I wanted to this past year, but also because everyone that would want to be here can't be. So um, I'm so grateful for those of you who've, who've been here and are, and are here and, um, and just your love for him. and. Uh, and so many people that have shown their love for us over the past weeks um, and as this condition worsened. And we're just so thankful for, for all of you. So um, let's pray. Father God, you are so good, but it is hard to remember sometimes. But we are thankful for you and for your guidance and for the peace that you provide in times like these that are so hard. We are so thankful for the life of Albert William Schroeder III, for Al, for Bill, however he went by to you. He loved you, God, and he passed that love on to me, and he showed it to me his whole life. And I'm so thankful for his servant heart and the way that that carried into his whole life. God, please be with us as we celebrate him today. As we mourn and as we grieve and as we look toward a future here without him, 
but also as we remember him and his legacy and think about how we can move that forward. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Psalm 19. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and right and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voices are not heard. Yet their voice goes out throughout all the world, 
and their words to the end of the world. In the heavens he has set, set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and nothing is hid from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord are, is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. But who can detect their errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from, his, from the insolent, and do not let them have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. If you will open your programs to the first song, it's on both pages, the spacious firmament on high. We're going to try to do this one together. <clears throat> The spacious firmament on high With all the blue ethereal sky And spangled heavens a shining frame Their great original proclaimed Unwearied sun from day to day Does his creator's power display and publishes to every land the work of an almighty hand. Am I really struggling trying to figure out what to say? Um, it's It's so sad, and you know, I, I love Brian and Barbara and Eric and my dad and Anne so much. I'm, I'm so sad for them and for everybody who knew Bill and loved him because he was so easy to love and um. And the thing I kept coming back to is that when I was a teenager, I went through a period where I was very sad and struggling with depression. And, um, and Bill called me, um, which felt like out of nowhere to me, but... You know, presumably he must have talked to my dad or something about what I was going through. And he just called to, to let me know that I wasn't alone. And that he had gone through similar things and that he just thought it was important that I know that I wasn't alone. And, um... It's just so awful that this is happening right now when we all have to be so far apart. And um, I just, in his memory, wanted to say that I know we're far apart, but none of us are alone right now. And I love you guys so much. Thank you. Hi, it's Anne here. Well, I'm not going to go into big speeches and to tell you all sorts of uh, funny incidents of our childhood with Bill and I and David because I'm sure that we'll have the chance to be able to tell things when I'm able to come. I'm, I'm really sorry I'm not able to be there with you. I just wanted to say, Bill, I love you. 
I will always love you. You have been the greatest brother, the greatest father, the greatest husband, I guess. <laughs> and I will be here for Barb and Eric and Brian and Kelly whenever they need me. You know, you were always the brother that was in, more introverted than I was, always typing away or reading Isaac Asimov or some comic strip or the Fantastic Four or Superman or whatever. And I do remember the day that you said to me, you know, I'm going to marry her with the first time you met Barb. You knew it. I knew it. And it was in the stars. Have a safe trip, my sweet brother. I'll see you on the other side. And I love you all. See you soon. Bill loved to learn. His appetite for knowledge was boundless. But at some point, this quest for knowledge led to a uh, crisis of identity. Who, who was he? What was his place in the world? Um, now, now, he weathered that storm and some years later, he remarked on that journey by quoting the words of Dan Fogelberg. Uh, he explained, explaining what he had learned in the process. And the words were these, love when you can, Cry when you have to. Be who you must. That's part of the plan. And one day, we'll all understand. Well, Bill, became comfortable in his own skin and at some point love found him. And through love he experienced the full measure of joy, laughter and tears He was greatly blessed by love. And now he's arrived in that place where his thirst for knowledge is finally quenched and he finally understands with a breadth and depth that we cannot yet imagine. But if he were here to console us, he would remind us that our grief is part of the plan. And that, like him, one day we'll all understand. I'm so much shorter than everyone else. Um, I just wanted to give y'all some context. That was um, Kate, Bill, or Al's niece. She lives in DC. Um, his sister, Anne, who lives in France and his brother Dave, who lives in San Diego, California. So all of them wanted to be a part of this service, but couldn't because obviously travel restrictions and everything make it difficult in this terrible, weird era that we're living in. So um, I just wanted to add that um, his sister-in-law, Terry, sent this for us to say. Um, she said, I couldn't submit myself, I couldn't bring myself to submit a video, but 
Bill was a man of great wit and of great kindness. Your mother brought such joy to his life, and being a family man was his proudest achievement. He always treated me as family, and I will miss his presence. So um, we thank Terry for sending that in. Also wanted to let y'all know, oh my God, I'm so loud, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I wanted to let y'all know that we are gonna do a little outdoor reception over at the Parthenon when this is over. We have everything individually wrapped and everything, so if you feel like you wanna come by and just say hi, you can. Um, so, but, um, I'm, my name's Kelly, I'm Brian's wife, I'm Barb and Al's daughter-in-law and Eric's sister. Um, my gift is my words, and for you guys, I've got nothing else, so. Um, the first time I saw Al was in the lobby of the Regal Cinema on Thompson Lane in the Hundred Oaks Mall. Brian and I had been dating for almost three months, and he had sheepishly asked me some days prior to the release of Spider-Man Homecoming if I'd be willing to see it with him and his dad. They had a tradition, he said. Uh, they saw all the superhero movies together. I knew this because on our second date had been to see Wonder Woman, and Brian had told me that he had already seen it um, because he had to go with his dad. So this time I agreed to kind of cut down on some of the multiple viewings for Brian. I felt a small amount of trepidation because it's always really nerve wracking when you're excited about dating someone and you're meeting their family. Um, but Brian told me later that after I left the theater, Al looked at him and said that he had the same reaction that people had had when Al started dating Barb um, and said, is she with you? <laughs> Are you sure? Um, he also, on our next superhero movie viewing, so the deepest seeds of discord in our relationship by saying that Marissa Tomei playing Aunt May was not true to Spider-Man's canon, which to this day I still believe is the rudest thing that William Albert Schroeder III ever said to me, and I will endure no Marissa Tomei slander in my life. So a few months later, after yet another superhero film, Brian told me that his mom wanted to meet me, so I went to their home with Al and Brian. I met Barb and Eric, and I saw stacks and stacks of comic books and books piled on shelves all around their living room, their dining area. They were everywhere. Um, and Al explained to me his theory of everything, saying that he believed that you could, theoretically, map all narratives together into one giant world tree, that all stories are happening together and that all at the same time, Y'all, Brian is my soulmate, if that is a thing that we want to ascribe in our modern world, you know. Um, but in that moment, I knew why he was my soulmate. <laughs> Al and I always understood each other in a way that I think surprised both of us. Um, he was a nerd, and I'm a nerd. I like long-winded fantasy stories. Al loved long-winded fantasy stories. And while I, I will never, ever in my life, enjoy world building on a level that he did, the books and volumes that he placed in my hands to read were some of my favorites. Al tried to love the things that I love, which, thinking about it now, was a bigger gift than I realized at the time. He read Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief because I love middle grade young adult novels. He read Lee Barduga's inter interpretation of Wonder Woman and Sarah J. Moss's interpretation of Catwoman. I know none of those words mean anything to you guys, but it meant a lot to me. Um, when he was alive, I felt like Al condescended to my interests sometimes. But now that I think about it, I think that estimation was really unfair to him. Al wanted to connect with me because we shared that angsty, haunted, trapped writer spirit. And for whatever reason, I just understood him and he understood me. I think that we as a culture love superhero narratives because they let us imagine what it would be like to be more to be able to face giant threats in our lives with the actual power to overcome them. As a human being with a very real and soft heart, a Chitari alien invasion led by Loki, the god of mischief, and Thanos, the mad titan, seems a lot more manageable in some ways than dealing with the deep, gut-riching grief of losing a beloved father, a cherished husband, a wonderful father-in-law especially if you have the power of Thor or the strength and endurance of Captain America. We want to be superhuman because life is hard and life is long, even when it's cut too short like Al's was. Al was a man who believed that he invented nachos, 
he poured paste picante and Tostitos cheese sauce on tortilla chips and called it breakfast. Al was a man who spent time to make coexisting timelines for the Lord of the Rings trilogy and our modern day existence. Al was a man who raised three amazing sons, which went, one of which I was never able to meet, one of which is literally the sweetest, most tender person I've ever met, and the other is Brian. <laughs> Al was of a devoted husband who loved his wife with a dogged devotion, and Al was a warrior going into comm data day after day, just like the dragons of customer complaints from truckers across the country. Al was a man who cared, who cared so deeply that caring was his superpower. Al was a superhero, and I was lucky to be his daughter-in-law. Thank you. writings from J.R.R. Tolkien. I have claimed that escape is one of the main functions of fairy stories, and since I do not disapprove of them, it is plain that I do not accept the tone of scorn or pity with which escape is now so often used. We have come from God, and inevitably the myths woven by us, though they contain error, will also reflect a splintered fragment of the true light, the eternal truth that is with God. Indeed, only by myth-making, only by becoming sub-creator and inventing stories, can man aspire to the state of perfection 
that he knew before the fall. Our myths may be misguided, but they steer, however shakily, towards the true harbor, while materialistic progress leads only to a yawning abyss in the iron crown of the power of evil. I didn't think it would end this way, Pippin lamented. End? Gandalf asked. No, the journey doesn't end here. Death is just another path, one that we all must take. The gray rain curtain of this world rolls back and all turns to silver glass, and then you see it. What, Gandalf, see what? White shores and beyond a far green country under a swift sunrise. Well, that isn't so bad. No, no it isn't. I'm so thankful for all of you who are here today and everyone who will watch this video later when they can. As hard as it is to say farewell to my dad on this side of time and space, it is so good to be reminded of the lives that he's touched. Over the past week, I've, been reached, I've, I've had so many people reach out to me with stories and comments, and it's been so great. He was a good man and perfect like all of us, but so, so good. He was kind and gracious and always willing to help or teach, really teach you about everything. You may have experienced that here in this building or at ComData or in his years in Boy Scouts or maybe even his online community of comic fans and creators where he posted his own web comics just to put them out there, to put his ideas out there for whoever would might maybe find them. We appreciate all of you coming to support Eric, my mom, and myself. Some of you already have given so generously to support my mom's ability to honor my dad in his death and all the costs associated with that. And for those of you who did that through the GoFundMe or elsewhere, we are so, so deeply thankful for that. Um, this community has been amazing during a really horrible time. Uh, I do not want to be here right now. <laughs> I don't want to be saying these words in the past week. As I have tried to find how to put these words to paper, it's been agonizing. Um, how do you sum up 60 years more of a story that is epic in one eulogy? I don't think you can. Um, so, Dad, if you're here or listening, uh, please forgive me in advance, because I'm going to get details wrong, and I know you hated that, and you would interrupt me if you could right now. Um, but you can't. I'm giving myself some license here, but uh, honestly, my dad would probably hate that I'm about to talk about him. Uh, he would probably want me to talk about his wonderful family, our family, uh, his beautiful wife, my mother. He, he loved her so much and gave so much of himself to her. If not that, he'd certainly want me to explain to you the anthropic principle to show how science and belief in God can hold together and you don't have to be at odds, you don't have to fight wars over this. Uh, if not that, he might want me to talk about how the merits of comic book storytelling or educate you on the comprehensive timeline that Kelly talked about, about Tolkien's Middle Earth. Or, or maybe he'd want me to look into the future to celebrate the comprehensive ways he sees the best science fiction classic all weaving together into a cohesive possible future for all of us. He was always focused outside of himself, on, on stories that other people told, on stories that he told for others, or on you. But I'm going to talk about him. Uh, Dad was born not far from here, just up the street, just north at Vanderbilt Hospital, and he died not far from here, up the street, just south at St. Thomas West. But he lived venturing through time and space, visiting faraway worlds and long-forgotten lands without any constrictions. He did this not only through the stories he so passionately loved and reread and rewatched over and over, but through the stories he himself created and put out into the world as he moonlighted as his own cartoonist. He was a multitasker in the ultimate sense, watching a Looney Tune while reading Tolkien, while sketching out the next page of his latest comic creation. And that was two weeks ago. <laughs> Still watching Looney Tunes. Still loving stories. My dad was content 
There's no better word for the way he viewed his life before the terrible disease started wearing his body down. He had a beautiful wife, children who loved him, a job he enjoyed where he felt valued, and hobbies which kept his mind sharp. But it took him a long time to get there, and a lot of struggle. As Kate and Dave alluded to, my dad struggled in his early life to know where he fit in the world. Bill, as he was called back then, was the kid in the corner of every room he was in, a book pressed so close to his nose that you would believe you had fu- he had fully lost himself to it. From a young age, he developed the ability to walk and read at the same time, which was something that he did for the rest of his life, as anyone from Comdata knows. They may have almost hit him a couple of times. He was always brilliant, learning, yearning for knowledge, but he was bullied for it. He was always unique, but it meant he felt alienated and isolated. Growing up is hard, and he felt it acutely. Uh, it led to a terrible day in his teenage years when he stood on top of Hillsborough High School, and he almost jumped, almost. His family came and, and rallied around him and talked him off the roof, but it didn't end his isolation or his depression. He still struggled to find his part in the plan. But he continued searching for knowledge, searching for clues in the universe. In science and religion and stories and myths, his love for knowledge was a search for meaning and purpose. And then one day, in a quiet worship setting at a little house here in Nashville, he had a moment of true peace. He saw in his heart what he described as an almost vase-like vessel. It was stuck in mud, dirty from years of darkness and decay. He described what he could only say was an invisible hand lifted out of the dirt, clean the dirt and dust off and empty the vase of all the muck and darkness that it contained, that he contained. And then he replaced that with a bright, shining blue light. He would probably hate me recounting this story because he always believed that you should base arguments for a creator in facts and science, not in personal spiritual experiences. But I'm not making an argument for a creator. I'm I'm telling you about my dad. From that moment on, dad's life wasn't easy but he knew he wasn't a mistake. He knew he had a purpose. As most of you know, his love for reading extended to comic books, which my dad devoured with an unmatched fervor that I have inherited only a fraction of despite my love for the medium. Through most of the 70s, he spent his time writing into DC Comics letter columns, giving ideas for better storylines and picking apart the ways that certain storylines failed the overall character's continuity. He would write long, detailed rants and sign them emphatically as Angry Al Schroeder the third. One day, he received a letter in response to one of his tirades from a fellow DC reader in Mississippi named Barbara Long. He wrote back, it turned out to be a nerd's dream scenario. A single, attractive woman wrote to him because he wrote into a comic book. (laughs) And romance formed and blossomed. They kept writing sending letters across the country, and visited. She, eventually she visited Nashville, and he visited Mississippi, and the rest is history. My mom and dad started a life together, taking their honeymoon in New York, where they retreated to town by editors at Marvel and DC, who knew him by name and appreciated his creative energy and academic study of their comics. A few years after they were married, they had my brother Jamie. A few years after that, they had me, and a few years after that, Eric. Two of us, of course, turned out to be nonverbal autistic. And the other one was a handful himself, too. It's not easy to raise one child with special needs, but it's near impossible to raise two. But they did it. All that time, my dad was there, going to work at Comdata every day to care for us financially and coming home to be present to the needs of Jamie and Eric alongside my mother. And as he took care of us, he radiated a peace and calm and contentment. He loved caring for my brothers and me and my mother. His love overflowed to us, and I rarely remember a grumble of resentment. He loved us so much and was so proud to have the family he had, warts and all. That shining blue light in his heart, perhaps, was a tenacious servant's heart that would be needed for all the trials to come. Losing my father is hard, But my father had to bury both parents and Jamie, his oldest son, within a decade. He knew grief, he knew tragedy, he knew sadness, and yet his servant heart continued to care for all of us. 
Even in that chaotic parenting he had to do, he never stopped writing, leveraging his love of science fiction, science fact, superheroes, and spirituality. Over the past week following his death, I've been slowly sifting through his writings and finding more and more deep wisdom about how he interacted with the world. My dad understood something that has become lost in a lot of people, I think. He valued curiosity more than anything until his dying day. He knew that curiosity of the universe, of other people, could change the world. Discovery and faith could be held hand in hand. He was able to make space for the wonder of God and also the inarguable nature of the scientific method. My dad loved stories more than anything else. I think there were a lot of things in his life that made him feel powerless, especially when he was younger. But he found power in the worlds that he was able to create in his own work, the characters he created, the stories he wrote, and he never received accolades for them. He wrote, he created because he needed to, because he had that creative power to do it, because he was made in the image of a creative God. I don't know how to end this, so I will let my dad end it with his own words from almost 18 years ago. I'll be 50 years old near Halloween. According to a lot of evolutionary thought, I'll be winding down. I've done my duty to the selfish gene, carried on my genes to the next generation, so evolution has no use for me now. Well, evolution can take a hike. I don't feel old, particularly, and hey, evidently, eventually we'll probably be grandparents. And grandparents have a role in helping bring up the next generation as well. And we'll always be parents in the primary caregiving sense. While Eric is alive, he'll always need some help, whether living in an assisted living apartment somewhere or with us. Hey, I wouldn't mind living to be a great-grandfather, even beyond. I, I don't fear death but I resent it. Does that make sense? I have a religious faith that eventually death is not the end, and it's possibly the passport to something glorious. But it'll come. It'll come eventually. I have no need to hurry it, but it will come. But I remain interested in this world here also. If scientists discovered a way to make life unending or at least centuries old, I'd take it, like a shot. Boredom, how does one grow bored or weary when we are always finding out new things? I could get bored or weary in the Middle Ages when there was no progress to speak of, no new things to try, and also there weren't comic books. There's no science to speak of. But in an ever very world, I want to see what happens next. How in the world does one get bored with this? Every year new facets of science come out to delight and puzzle us. Every year, new writers try to create beauty and in a few cases succeed. Every year, new artists sing or paint and otherwise try to express themselves. I would have to be immortal. Only then would I live long enough to experience everything I want to experience. I've known depression and despair, and yes, suicide was once a very close companion. But the more I experience, the more I don't want to give it up. How does one give it up? I know I'll die someday. But I'm going to fight every step of the way because I find this world a fascinating place. Of course, that could change if something, I've been extremely lucky in who I have for a partner in life. We mesh and fit in a way that is near miraculous. But if something happened to her, if she preceded me, maybe. Odds are I'll go before she does, being older and male to boot. A lot of people think we've had it pretty bad. And riches have certainly eluded us, and we've had our fair share of heartbreak. Yet in all, we remain a family that loves each other, despite being the oddest family this side of the Osbournes, if you wanted to date this. I know that one way or the other, the love and affection between Barb and I will last. Life is good, filled with odd moments, beyond my deserving. If I died tomorrow, it would still have been good. Good beyond hope. I'm loved and have loved, and I'm surrounded by children who love me and a wife who does also. I've lived through tragedy that would break some men. And joy unspeakable, joy beyond hope. I've lived in the truest sense of the word. I haven't gone out of my way to make my life exciting. Yet the challenges put on me are sufficient for most and more. If I die tomorrow, I can say that. Not a second wasted, 
save in the best sense, on the couch, wasted in the way I wanted to do it. If I died tomorrow, my life would not have been wasted. And I don't plan on dying tomorrow. I might die tomorrow, tomorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow. But not forever. Forever is for after. One of his favorite series of all time was the Lord of the Rings trilogy by Tolkien. And going through his old blog, I found that multi-page outline of how he estimated the timeline of Lord of the Rings based on our own dating system and figured out that wh where the years match up. Ask me about it if you want. In those books, when Frodo returns from his terrifying journey to the heart of Middle-earth, the elves offer him safe passage to leave Middle-earth, to go to find rest in what Tolkien himself called beyond. It's a well-known story told often. Frodo carried the weight of the world on a silver chain around his neck and successfully destroyed it. He saved the entire world, but Frodo didn't come home joyful and full of life. He came home tired, wizened, a different hobbit than the one that left the Shire. I think the reason that my dad was so enamored with figures like Peter Parker and Clark Kent, who would also go by the name Spider-Man and Superman, was because he believed in his heart that he was a hero. It may have been a small, small epic that he lived here and there, caring for my brothers and us, but the stories he told, the way that he lived, was heroic. He was good, and he was loved. I believe that my dad is home now. Whatever the next life looks like, he is reunited with Jamie. I like to imagine he can finally hold a conversation with his oldest son, and soon we will all be reunited and talk again. Over my life, he meant a lot of different things to me, but he was a teacher, a servant, a friend. He was a father, a brother, a husband, a son whose tenacious loyalty never gave up on the people he loved. But more than anything, his, he had a light, that light inside of him that shone so brightly from his heart, a vision of God's wisdom and love to all who met him. Rest in wisdom, Al, Bill, and Dad. And then uh, we're going to sing, Be Thou My Vision. <clears throat> Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me save that thou art. Thou my best thought by day. my light. Be thou my wisdom and thou my true word. I ever with thee and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father and I thy true Son. Thou
Thank you all again for being here this afternoon. Uh, don't forget uh, that there is uh, going to be food at Centennial Park after this, um, which is just right down the street here. So you can definitely uh, go and be a part of that and see the family there. Uh, make sure to grab yourself a program um, on the way out. That would be wonderful. And yeah, just thank you for your presence. This has been a beautiful service. And yeah, and we love you. We love you. Yeah. We just tell I won't make you repeat it. <laughs> um, just uh, if you do want to say anything to my, my mother, um, sh she'll be in one of these rooms down the hallway. There'll be kind of a half door closed just so that, you know, we can take COVID precautions. But if you do want to say anything to her, um, she'll be in there just down this hallway here. So um, if you're looking for, for where to talk with her, that's where. Yeah. Very good. Uh, if you'll stand with me, I'll say a closing benediction prayer for us and then we'll have the family exit and then after that you all will be able to exit too. O Lord our God our refuge and strength in times of trouble meet us in our sorrow lift our eyes to the peace and light of your compassionate hand Dispel our fear with love, ease our loneliness with your presence, and renew our hope with your promise. Help us to trust your love in darkness and light, in sadness and joy. May we serve you faithfully and praise your name. You are eternally gracious, merciful, and caring. Send your Holy Spirit to comfort our hearts in the light of your glory and grace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray this. Amen.